Japan was the trip of a lifetime. In 2016, me and my oldest school friend Juna made the spontaneous decision to use the remains of our student loans to buy plane tickets to Japan. We were in Tokyo for a week before heading into the mountains further south, but before we left, I knew I wanted to take on the challenge of Mount Fuji. But as the morning arrived in our foul smelling hostel, nerves started to kick in. Then it got dramatically worse. At half six in the morning, an earthquake struck. Luckily, the earthquake was far enough away we just felt the tremors and no one was hurt. But we were on the ninth floor, the top floor of the hostel, and the whole thing was shaking. You could tell we weren't in any serious danger when the Japanese people in our dorm just carried on their day like normal. One man even chose to brush his teeth during the earthquake. Stepping out the hostel was the first time we'd seen rain in Tokyo. A welcome relief from the constant 30 degree heat. Before we took on our first, and let's face it, most likely last, mountain ascent, I had booked a table for breakfast at the Moomin Cafe. Our dining experience was completely bizarre, with Moomin inspired dishes and cutlery. Sitting surrounded by Moomin inspired merchandise, they placed a giant Moomin cuddly toy in every seat at your table. This is Juna and a Moomin companion. I wouldn't recommend it for the food, but I'd definitely recommend it for the atmosphere and novelty factor. I naively assumed Moomin's were a Japanese invention, but after a quick Google, I actually found they originate from Scandinavia. After the cafe, I think we might have been clutching at straws that a visit to one of the thousands of temples would lead to a successful climb of the mountain. So we picked one to visit. Unfortunately, during the pouring of water onto the face to cleanse, both Juna and I's sun cream started running onto our faces and we got the giggles. We were then asked to leave. Fair enough. So joyously and very naively, a common theme today, we returned to the train station. Of course, we had failed to buy a train ticket in advance and all the tickets had been sold for the upcoming week. Instead, we had to take a more scenic route that involved four local buses and two trains. It's not as close as you might think. With our spirits still high and slight travel sickness, we reached the starting point of the mountain climb, just as the sun was setting. You may be forgiven for thinking that we had actually planned for this expedition, but in fact, I actually had no idea that most visitors to Tokyo didn't even take this on, and it could be very dangerous. Juno was even more underprepared, choosing to take on a 3,700 meter climb in her skinny jeans and converse. Depending on which route you choose, it should take between seven and 10 hours to reach the summit. Taking the easiest path, obviously, we struck up a conversation with Courtney, a student from Australia who is currently traveling around Asia on her own. Being the same age, we all hit it off straight away and she ended up walking the whole way with us. Starting at 8pm, it was already pitch black, so we had no idea of the challenge we were taking on. Probably a good thing. As the clock ticked past midnight, there were thousands of walkers doing the through the night climb, all with head torches and lights, apart from Gina. At one point, the group of people in front of us broke away about 100 metres ahead, so I decided to keep the momentum going and lead my group. It wasn't until I reached the viewpoint did I realise that I hadn't just been leading my group, but hundreds of people up the mountain. Watching all their lights weaving up the trail behind me was a truly unforgettable moment. Starting to flag around 2am, a welcome surprise paced past us. An elderly Japanese gentleman practically running to the top while carrying a boombox playing Bruno Mars's Lazy Soul. Unfortunately, this didn't work as any kind of antidote as both Juna and Courtney started to feel the effects of altitude sickness. Now, I'm the kind of person who gets hay fever in the summer, colds in the winter, and car sickness all year round. But thankfully, despite fully expecting to be, I wasn't affected by the height at all. As we got higher and higher, both their lungs were getting tighter and tighter, and on top of that, it was getting colder, around three degrees at that point. We kept stopping allowing them to catch their breath, but this meant standing in the bitter wind, in darkness, on the edge of a mountain. But we made it, we reached the summit at quarter past three in the morning. And by this point, Juno was wearing every piece of headwear I had packed, and I packed a whole bag of Fuji headwear in my suitcase. Yet, this wasn't enough. Suffering from both the cold and the altitude sickness, I looked down to see her shaking in the fetal position on the floor of the mountain hut at the summit. As much as we joke around, we've been great friends for years, and seeing her in that state really scared me. We had seen each other through our first clubbing years before we went our separate ways to uni, so we had witnessed each other finding the alcohol tolerance, but I'd never seen her like this. Luckily, there were some fellow climbers from Mongolia and France who had just reached the summit. 
They were experienced climbers and knew what to do. The Mongolians led an impromptu group exercise class, getting everyone up, doing squats and star jumps, getting everybody warm. Courtney and I helped Juna up and one of the French climbers lent Juna their coat. Within minutes, due to the kindness of other people, she was back to normal and ready for the half four sunrise. It was absolutely breathtaking. Watching the sun peer over the horizon and slowly up over the smaller mountains was sensational. For the next couple of hours, we barely spoke, sitting with Courtney, staring out at the beautiful vista. Then the inevitable happened. We had to return to the bottom of the mountain. This was much harder for me than the incline due to the amount of pressure on your knees, walking down under the volcanic ash which slips under your foot. Then at 10am, after descending for four hours, we were just so exhausted from not sleeping. For around 27 hours at that point we had been awake, we literally couldn't go a step further. So we did what all the other tired climbers do and napped on the side of the mountain. We had hit the wall just as we started walking through the clouds, so we literally slept in the clouds. Waking up, we realised this was somewhat more of a romanticised idea than a practical one. After an hour's kip, we were drenched in condensation from the clouds and freezing cold. But the hour of sleep made all the difference, and we found the descent much easier and ended up getting to the end after six hours, almost skipping down. After saying goodbye to Courtney, and following each other on Instagram of course, our hike up the mountain was rewarded with a three hour traffic jam on the coach on the way back. All the other tourists and mountain climbers were complaining, but I secretly enjoyed having the excuse to catch up on some much needed sleep. On returning to Tokyo, the plan was to collect our luggage at the station and get the train Juna had organised to our next destination, Takiyama. But as I'm referring to it as the plan, you can probably deduce it did not quite go that way. Due to the three hour traffic jam, we arrived at the train station much later than anticipated, but we still had time to spare for our train. As the main Tokyo station is just so huge and we get lost anyway, we decided to find the platform first to save on dragging our bags around, looking more lost than usual. Rather strangely though, our train wasn't on any of the departure boards. Yeah, you can see where this is going. So we found the information desk. Turns out Juna had booked a train for the week before, and not only that, we had missed the last train to Takayama. Sleep deprived and hungry, we sloped off silently to collect our bags and find a hostel for the night. But as it was so late, the baggage centre had now closed and our bags were locked away for the night, incurring a fine we would have to pay in the morning. With our debit cards, pyjamas and toiletries locked away for the night, we emptied our pockets and counted our money. With a quick frustrated glance at one another, we knew there was only one hostel we could afford. So we went back to our much flawed, toilet scented hostel we had left just the morning before. But that night, lying on my rock hard bed, covered with a dirty duvet cover, with the aircon blaring above me all night, I had no care in the world. It was one of the best, most challenging days of my life.